Welcome to this special edition of Archetypes Unbound. Well, these archetypes are all requests. They were all interesting. I don't... I have so many opinions. I just want to throw them at you, but I won't yet. So let's get into the Curse Maelstrom dedication. The Curse Maelstrom archetype is an archetype under the premise that you have some sort of serious curse that resides inside your body. And then you explode in this curse if you screw something up in an unlucky way. And then you can use that curse to throw at an enemy and screw them over. Problem is, it's an area of fact. So in 10 feet around you, everybody gets penalties, not just the bad guys. Alrighty, so... Curse Maelstrom Dedication gives you two things. One is if you suffer a misfortune effect that an enemy does. So you can't curse yourself. So which Curse Maelstroms won't really help. Or if you succeed on a roll in combat, your GM can say that you uh, can re-roll that. And if you are willing to re-roll it, then you also enter you also enter a Curse Maelstrom state. So the, the two ways you can do it is an enemy gives you a misfortune effect, or the GM says you could re-roll that roll that you succeeded at if you want to release your curse. It's weird that this requires so much GM input. Anyway, so that's how you activate the curse. That's how you activate your, your you, you, you enter a curse maelstrom state. While in this state, all people in a 10 foot radius around you get minus one to, it's a minus one status penalty to all saving throws and skill checks. While you're in a curse maelstrom state, you can target one enemy within 60 feet and force them to make a saving throw. It's a will save. If they get a critical success, it does nothing. If they get a success, they get minus one to all saving throws and skill checks for a minute. So it's the same exact thing that you suffer from when you get this bad luck curse thing in combat. If they fail, they take minus two status pen penalty to saving throws and skill checks for 10 minutes. A little bit better. That's okay. That's good. Critical failure. That's kind of fun. The Maelstrom pitches the, character, the creature into a single fit of utter misfortune before burrowing into its soul as failure, but they also have to roll twice and take the lower of the two rolls for their next saving throw. Great way to set up your casters to succeed. This archetype works really well if you're melee, because then you're right up front of the bad guys. The bad guys get the negative one to all of their checks. You never get the negative one. And you can choose one of them to curse. So if you are like backline or midline, you pretty much only want to use this on one bad guy at a time by activating your curse and throwing it at them. Because if you're around your allies, you're going to give them all negative one to these checks and that sucks in combat. Before we go further, I want to point out that this curse can be completely role play, just backstory. You don't have to take the cursed background. You don't have to take a family curse. You don't have to be an oracle with a curse. You can just say, hey, I want this archetype. GM, give me a curse. It doesn't even have to do anything besides what this archetype does. It can, it could be interesting. Maybe you're cursed with like intermittent vampirism. It only works during the day because it screws you. Also at second level, you can take the feat Familiar Oddities. It gives you plus two to identify magic on a cursed item or a spell that has the cursed trait. We're gonna see a common theme here. I mess with or know about magic curses. If you don't have a GM that uses curses, those features don't do anything. But if you do, like if you're in Ravenloft, I know that's D&D, but if you're in Ravenloft, there are curses everywhere. Like the land curses you for being a bad guy, not for being a good guy, which is weird. In that case, in a curse rich environment, this would be kind of overpowered actually, because eventually you can send a curse back to the, the cursor, blinking cursor, no. Um, 
eventually you can send the curse back to the person who cast the curse or you can no I guess that's the, that's the best thing you can send curses back to the enemy who cast the curse eventually which is cool but again if you don't have a GM that uses curses it doesn't matter at all level 4 feet unnerving expansion it takes an action this is very interesting so normally your curse maelstrom state lasts for one minute when it activates and that's when it's in its default state when it's hitting everyone around you at a 10 foot radius if you take an action you can expand it and there's no limit you can keep doing this every action you have for the entire duration of the curse maelstrom state so in the best of situations you can make this reach a hundred feet away from you and give minus one check to everyone in that area and each time you expand it you get to make a demoralized check so you could make three demoralized checks every round for a minute expanding this every time you're kind of just a fear maelstrom that's a really cool image it doesn't do anything much unless, like, you go to an enemy army and you make everybody in the army take minus one to skill checks and saving throws. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not great. This archetype has its uses, but they're very niche. It's not that impressive. So, moving on. Share burden. At level six, it's a feat that allows you to steal a curse you basically redirect a curse that is targeting an ally to you you can't already be in the area of the curse or affected by the curse but you have to be a valid target for it as well like if you're an elf and it only affects dwarves you can't steal it but if somebody gets cursed near you within 60 feet you can choose to use this reaction to have it only affect you instead great cool wouldn't it be better if you had like a counter spell action instead? I mean, it's a six level feat. What am I missing? <sighs> level eight feet, a cursed magic. It gives you a variety of abilities. You get them as you increase your level. So at eighth level, you get claim curse, which means you walk up to somebody. If they are suffering a curse, you touch them and they're not for five minutes. Cool. You can use it once a day to give someone a reprieve from a curse they're already suffering for five minutes. That's just stinky. So, a cursed magic, the eighth level feat ability, when you reach level 10, it lets you cast seal fate once per day as an occult spell. These are all occult spells. Everything's occult in this archetype. What that does is you give someone weakness two to one type of damage that you choose. There's a short list depending on how well they save it may do nothing or it lasts up to one round or it's permanent if they reach zero from that damage type within that duration they die okay well monsters and enemies usually die at zero anyway so cool and you're level 10 couldn't you have done something else during that entire time that they were suffering for it from it and taking damage couldn't you do something better at 10th level? I mean, again, okay, fine. Maybe you are a melee fighter and you have no other actions you want to take at 10th level. And you give them weakness to slashing and you hit them with your sword and that does extra damage. That's cool. It's like a passive bonus, but you still have to cast the spell in combat they get to try to hit you if they have the reaction. And, you know, we talked about opportunity. This just is so clunky. It's so hard to make this work well. All right, so the same ability, Accursed Magic, the eighth level feat. At 12th level, it gives you Inevitable Disaster. It's a cool name. Uh, there's a good feel. It's just like you can sink your teeth into the grossness of this archetype. But if they fail a fortitude save, one target, 
1d4 rounds later, they take 55 damage. It's level 12. Couldn't you cast Chain Lightning? Okay, fine. You're not a caster. 1d4 rounds later, at level 12, you're dealing shit tons of damage. Wouldn't you have dealt 55 damage by then anyway, if you're just hitting them? Or, again, you're in melee, you're casting it, maybe it's passive, so like eventually they'll take that damage if they're still alive by then. You're still casting a spell in melee combat, they still get a reaction to try to hit you if they have attack of opportunity. Arr, so clunky. Alright, moving on. This is a stupid archetype. I don't know why anybody would ever has this. It's just dumb. I don't like it. It's stupid. Before we go further, I just want to point out that any of these abilities can only be used if you're currently in your Curse Maelstrom state. In case I didn't mention it. At level 8, the feat Counter Curse. As a reaction, if you're in a Curse Maelstrom state and you or an ally within 30 feet is targeted by or in the emanation of an effect of a curse, you can try to cancel it. You're basically just a spell magicking it by throwing your cursey magic at it. Whether you succeed or fail, your curse maelstrom state ends. Okay, cool. Dispel magic, great. It's only for curses, so again, it only works if you're in a campaign with curses. And because a curse maelstrom state can only happen uh, once every minute, like you have to have a cooldown of a minute after you're done with the curse. You can only use this once a minute, so you can use this once per fight. If someone uses a curse for a feat, it's just not worth a feat! In my opinion, the reason to take this archetype, the level 10 feat, Torrential Backlash. It's a two action activity, you have to be in a Curse Maelstrom state. As soon as you use this ability, your Curse Maelstrom state ends. But I want to point out that you could wait like nine rounds in, so it's about to expire anyway, and you've been expanding it the whole time with unnerving expansion. Best case scenario, that's what we're doing here. You deal 1d6 negative damage for each level you have with a basic fortitude save they get. It's everyone in that emanation except you takes 1d6 negative damage, so it's at least 10d6. You can do it up to 145 feet away. Yeah, 145 feet away. 140 feet away. So everyone in the 140 foot area, so it'd actually be a 280 foot area because it's 140 out from you. They would take 10d6 negative damage. That's great. I mean, you just killed a whole shit ton of people. But, like, that's good if you're an evil bastard. Otherwise, if you're a melee fighter, again, best if you're a melee fighter, you're in melee combat, the bad guys are right in front of you trying to take you down, you do this and they all take 10d6. That's freaking great, as long as you don't have any friends who are also melee. I don't really have much negative to say about this. It's a good ability. It's cool. It's also really flavorful. The reverse curse ability at level 12 that you can take is... If you do successfully counter a curse, the level 8 ability, you don't just dispel it, or you don't just counter it, you, you don't counter it, it goes back to the caster. So you reverse it, basically, which is again really cool thematically. All of these are really cool thematically, and if you're in a curse-heavy campaign, I would seriously think about taking this, especially if you are melee, and you don't have many other melee people in your group. This could totally be useful passively, minorly, but it will help your casters out. It's a good team play. That's weird. Curse Maelstrom is a good team player archetype. It is, though. Okay, so all in all, I don't like this. I would never use this except for NPCs because who cares what they do? If you're a caster, think twice before taking this and then think about it again. And if you still want to do it, come talk to me. I'll slap you out of it. Overall, the Curse Maelstrom archetype is interesting. In melee, it's passively useful. At higher levels, it can be extremely useful in the right circumstances. Not really useful for people who are going to be standing next to their allies, especially if they're facing spellcasters. What I would do with this archetype is I would basically bounce 
in and out of it. Well, not in and out of it. You, I would take at least the three feats you have to to get out of this and then take other feats. So what I would do is use this archetype for the level 2, level 4, level 8, and level 10 abilities. So Curse Maelstrom Dedication, obviously, Unnerving Expansion, Accursed Magic, because it gives you some minor abilities, they may or may not matter. I don't know. But that sweet, sweet level 10 Torrential Backlash, that's a good one. So 2, 4, 8, 10. That's what I would use from this archetype. Moving on. The Ursine Avenger Hood from the Treasure Vault Tome. First I gotta say, I love the picture. Hi guys, I found a chest! Nah. So, we'll go to the actual artifact that gives you the archetype, which is cool. It's a great idea. There are two of these in this uh, in the Treasure Vault book. And I plan on creating some myself. I hope they make a lot more of them because an artifact that gives you an archetype is totally unique. I love it. Since this is a magical item, it has benefits besides giving you the archetype that gives you powers. They're really minor because it's, an, it's a level two item because the archetype starts at level two, like most of them do. So they had to give it a passive ability that's really minor. So once you're invested in this, oh, I'm sorry. It's a cowl made from a cave bear's skull and fur. So part of that is that you can actually put the fur over your arms. Like it's a bunch of fur. Once you invest in this, you get plus one to nature checks to command an animal which increases to plus two if, you're, if it's a bear. Not if you're a bear. If it's a bear. <laughs> you also constantly long for wide open places and you hate being in towns. And so you take a minus one penalty to all diplomacy checks to gather information or make an impression if you go more than five days inside a large town or city without spending at least four hours in the wilderness. So you're just like scampering outside of town constantly. It's a cute flavor. I like it. It's interesting that it has a destruction note here, because artifacts always should. I don't know why you'd ever want to destroy this, because it's just useful. It's cool flavor. The first ability it gives you is Ursine Avenger Form. It's level two feet, like usual for archetypes. You draw the hood over your head and the fur over your arms and you have a bear head now and bear fur covered arms that end in claws and you have big bear fangs and you can't speak complex sentences. I'll get to that in a moment. So you get a bite attack, jaws attack, it's weird, does 1d8 piercing damage and a claw unarmed attack does 1d6 slashing, both in the brawling group, obviously. So the interesting thing about this is, I mean, sure, great. At level two, you have natural attacks that do good damage. You lose the ability to speak complex sentences while transformed and can only communicate through grunts and gestures. This prevents you from using effects that require a shared or spoken language until you revert back to your non-hybrid form. This has nothing about not being able to use verbal components for a spell. Verbal components don't necessarily have the linguistic trait to them. Certain spells do. So if you're trying to like... Uh, charm someone or insult someone as part of a spell and you have to share a language you can't use that ability it just doesn't work you can't talk if you're trying to cast a spell with verbal components it technically does not say you can't so you still can as a bear I don't know I have no idea how you'd pronounce things as a bear whatever level 4 for the Ursine Avenger Hood is Senses of the Bear. While in Ursine form, you know, so you take the action to put your head on and your arms and claws, you get low light vision and imprecise scent to 30 feet. If you already had low light vision, it improves to dark vision. Useful senses, it really depends on your campaign whether that's useful or not. I personally don't think it's world shattering, but it is a minor benefit in the right circumstances or with the right GM, scent especially, can really matter to an adventure, could keep you alive. I'm one of those people. I let you smell things that smell strong from farther away. Anyway, so it's an eh, but doesn't hurt. 
bear hug at level six. If you hit with a claw strike, you use this one action to make another claw strike. If you hit with both of them, you also automatically grab them. That is a cool, almost unique perk. Grabbing somebody that easily is so great. They don't get to fight out of it. They, I mean, of course they can on their turn, but it just automatically grabs them. They're immobilized and you can do fun shenanigans with them, which I'll get to in a moment. I'm going to go over all the archetype abilities first before I give my suggestions about how you can mix and match this for the most optimal fun. Level 8, Call Ursine Ally. In combat, not that useful because you summon things that are so low powered. But what it does is, once per hour you can cast a third level, summon animal as an innate spell, but only to summon a black bear. At 10th, it can be a grizzly bear. At 12th, it is a polar bear. At 14th, it's a cave bear. These are always going to be fun to use, especially just to mess with commoners or as a distraction in or outside of combat. But they, they'll just get slaughtered in combat. They're not considered your companion, so you don't get any like additional companion benefits with this beastie. It's it's cool a little bit. It can flank for you. It's just not that great for an eighth level feat. It's totally cool and fun. It's just not really that effective. Okay, at tenth level, you have a thing for bears. Yeah, you. No, um, you have a magical affinity for bears, and you can speak to them through sounds and body languages. Languages. Language. You can communicate with all bears and other Ursine creatures, like a werebear in bear form. This is fun. It is totally useless in combat. And it's useful if you have Call Ursine Ally from level 8. Otherwise, it really depends on the GM. This, this this whole archetype is so full of flavor and fun, and it's just not that powerful. But it doesn't necessarily matter. You can just have fun doing this. Okay, at level 12, Great Bear. Uh, once per hour, when you put on your head and your claws, you can enlarge yourself as well. That's cool. You become large-sized, you get extra damage. It's good. Level 14. When you shapeshift, take on your Ursina Vendor form. Head, claws. You can make a demoralized check against each enemy within 30 feet. They don't have to understand your language. You're just roaring at everything in 30 feet, enemies. So it's really useful for a group demoralize, which gives the frightened condition, and then it fades. And they're immune to it. So level 14 feet, eh, level five feet, sure, four. I'm sorry, I'm just not a big fan. It can be useful, but is it worth a level 14 feet? There are other more powerful, more effective, and more fun 14th level feats. Fearsome Fangs, level 16 feet. Your natural weapons upgrade. So your jaws now does d12s and your claws does d8s. Passive, minor benefit, for the price of a feat you could, it's not huge. It's just a passive, minor benefit. Level 18, Mighty Bear. Like Great Bear, it allows you to use the Enlarge spell when you change into your Ursine Avenger form. But in this case, it is heightened to fourth level, so you're huge. That could be totally fun. That allows you a lot of control over the battlefield because you are freaking enormous. Level 20, Immortal Bear. I love this ability. When you're in Ursine Avenger form, you get fast healing five. It's hard as hell to kill you. That's a fun ability. All right, now, my suggestions. If you're using the bonus archetype variant rule, which it actually mentions at the beginning of this archetype, as though it's suggesting that you should use it because it's good and 
fun, and that's really the only way this works well. So what you do is, at second level, you take the Ursine Avenger form at level two. At, at second level, yeah, obviously. Um, if you'll notice at the bottom of that text, it does not say that this is a dedication or that you have to take two other feats from this archetype before you can take any others. So you don't have to. You can take just that to start with. Your other second level feat, class feat, you take wrestler dedication. We're going to go with a wrestling bear. <clears throat> so now you're a wrestler bear at level four you spend your archetype feet and your class feet on crushing grab so that when you automatically grab later on you'll immediately and automatically do damage great also suplex if your enemy is grabbed you spend one action to make a melee strike to bend over backwards and slam their head into the ground and they're prone if you get a critical success it's a bunch of bludgeoning damage too at level six you go back to the ursine avenger for the bear hug ability so that you can use all of those abilities that you just got from wrestler really well um and now because you have taken three archetype feats from wrestler you can keep going back and forth whenever you like so at level six you'll take the bear hug from the ursine avenger and from the wrestler you'll take clinch strike so if your grappled enemy tries to get away you get to hit him that's just cool at level eight you'll take whirling throw and running tackle so you can run into your enemy and tackle them and shove them as a bear. And if you have them grabbed, so you strike once with your claw, you succeed at your other strike, you grab them uh, automatically. You can either suplex them to make them prone, or you can throw them. And you will randomly to see how far you can throw them. I'm just imagining this bear turning in a circle, going, rrr, 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 and launching somebody 20 feet. Especially if there's like, you know, a convenient pit trap nearby or a cliff or a body of water. At level 10, I would go for spine breaker. At level 12, I would go for great bear to get the large size and then back to wrestler for inescapable grasp. And at 14, wrestler form lock to break polymorph. At 16th, go to fearsome fangs so you can upgrade your you can upgrade your bite and your claw attacks. 18, mighty bear so you're huge. 20th, fast healing five. That would be such a fun wrestler build. <laughs> Sorry, I'm choking on my glee. Please, someone do this and tell me how fun it is. Mm -mm. Anyway, that's my review of the Ursine Avenger Hood. Moving on. I'm having a little too much fun with this. The Hallowed Necromancer. I was truly reluctant to do this one. But I discovered some cool things about it. And other things that work well with it. So, I'm gonna enjoy this. Level 2. You take the dedication, it's an actual dedication, not like the Ursine Avenger Hood. And it gives you the Hallowed Ground Focus spell, and it gives you a focus point. It just does damage to undead in a small area. That's all you get for second level. Um, also, if you try to create undead, heal undead, or promote undead, or maybe even be like friends with undead, depending on your GM, you lose your Hallowed Necromancer powers. You have to use, you have to get someone to do an atone ritual for you or you do it yourself to get the powers back. Keep that in mind because that is interesting depending on your build. You might need to do something with undead later. And if you are with a party that is assisting undead, your GM could rule that you lose all your powers. It would be a dick move, but they could do it. Anyway. The level 4 Hallowed Necromancer feed, Hallowed Initiate. 
you get to choose one of two abilities. You either get the Necromancer School spell Call of the Grave or the Initial Domain spell of the Death Domain Death's Call, and you get another focus point. You can take this feat again later to get the other ability. So the first ability, Call of the Grave, it allows you to fire a ray and make a spell attack to make someone sickened, and you have a chance of making them slowed one. Minor benefit, it could be useful, but slow is pretty powerful, so that's cool. Death's Call is the ability that I would take. It, if anything, including undead, dies within 20 feet of you. You can use a reaction to gain a number of temporary hit points equal to their level plus your spellcasting ability modifier. If they're undead, you gain double that amount. For fighting undead, that is awesome. Great way to protect yourself and keep you alive. At level 4, you get the ability Sacred Spells, if you want to take it. You add Chill Touch, Death Ward, Disrupt Undead, Disrupting Weapons, Holy Cascade, and Magic Stone and Sunburst to your spell list. They all count as necromancy spells, even if they're not normally. You can either prepare them or add them to your repertoire, just like repertoire, just like spells normally on your tradition spell list. So there are additional benefits that you gain aside from just having access to these spells. If you're a prepared spellcaster, you can spend 10 minutes to replace one of the spells you've prepared with a spell of the same level from the list of sacred spells. You can do this while refocusing. Totally convenient and a great option. And at level 4, this is actually a really good feat. If you're a spontaneous spellcaster with a signature spells class feature, which includes oracles, add two of the spells from the list of sacred spells to your repertoire automatically. You just gain them as extra. That's great. There are signature spells for you in addition to your normal signature spells. This is really powerful. For fourth level feat, this is rare. Good feat in general has some really nice applications. Level six, Death Warden. You gain resistance to negative damage equal to half your level and a plus one status bonus on saves against effects with a negative trait. Cool. That is really good. Don't get me wrong but you could also get it from your ancestry if you wanted to. It's just a thought. Still, if you're going to be messing with undead, you really want to reduce negative damage and fear and disease and other stuff like that. Level eight, advanced hallowed spell. You get two options again, two different spells. If you choose Eradicate Undeath, it is a cone in 30 feet that does 4d12 damage to all undead in the area. Positive damage. That's all it does. It's cool against your against undead, which obviously you're fighting if you're taking this archetype. But the more flexible spell is Life Siphon that allows you to take. So those are the two options. Life Siphon and Eradicate Undeath. Life Siphon, when you are casting a Necromancy spell, you can use your reaction to heal 1d8 hit points per level of the spell. That's any necromancy spell, which includes all of those spells that you took at an earlier level that got converted to necromancy spells. So like Sunburst, you heal from. That's great. Again, really strong against undead. Also just a really strong class feature, uh, archetype feature. Sorry. Ow, ow, you have claws. Positive Luminance, 8th level feat. It gives you the domain spell Positive Luminance. Some people hate this because it's an extra resource to track during a fight, and it is. However, it can be extremely useful for healing or fighting undead. This spell takes one action to cast. It lasts for a minute. You don't have to sustain it. And it gives you a Luminance Reservoir, which begins with a value of four at the start of each of your turns you can use a free action to increase the luminance reservoir by five by four sorry if you do the radius of your light increases by 10 feet so it starts with bright light of 10 feet every round you can spend a free action increasing the number by four and the radius of light by 10. if undead enter that area while you have the spell active they take they automatically take damage equal to half of the amount of your luminance points let's call them That's only the first time they enter the area, but they take the damage automatically, and you don't lose anything. It's just extra protection for you. You can dismiss the spell. If you do, 
You choose one undead, and they take an amount of damage equal to the total number of points you've accumulated. So after one minute, ten rounds, forty points, they just take forty. There's no save. Or you can heal an ally for that amount. This is wonderful. This is an extremely flexible spell. It it doesn't require any effort from your character. I mean, your player. You, you have to actually keep track of this and count it every round. But this is extremely flexible, useful, and it's powerful. This is a, a good feat. A good spell. Both. The last ability for the Hallowed Necromancer, Consecrated Aura, is level 14. You have an aura around you at all times of 20 feet. It's a radius within which undead are terrified by your radiance, your aura. It's just an aura of positive energy. It doesn't say it creates light. But if any undead is in the area, they have to make a saving throw against your spell DC or they become frightened one, frightened two on a critical failure. This is just constant and it's a little protection for yourself and your party. If you're fighting a lot of undead, like frequently, it's great. If not, it's crap. No matter what, it is passive, and that's also that's always nice. If there's like a passive defense on you, that's hard to come by. So this is cool. Yes, it's restricted to only undead, but it gives a frightened condition, and that kind of sucks. So this is a, a good feat, even though it's only useful on undead. On undead, as with this entire archetype, if you're fighting undead, it's great. If you're not fighting undead. It's mostly shit. You can take other things that are better. The Hallowed Necromancer can be very useful, flexible, powerful. Not just against undead, but it gives you certain resources, mostly for healing, a little bit of protection that can be useful for a variety of builds. I am creating two builds for the Hallowed Necromancer. It's going to be in a separate video. I've delved into this so much that it needs its own video now. I do like the Hallowed Necromancer after researching. In short, the Hallowed Necromancer can be useful for an Oracle at range and with healing, or for a Magus in melee or range doing damage. And the Magus would have some healing abilities, and the Oracle would have some extra damaging abilities. So those are both fun concepts. I'm going to release the archetype build video as fast as I can, and then there's going to be a Download for the document on our website. The link will be in the description of the next video that comes out. Thank you for joining me, and I want to say a big appreciative thanks to my patrons. Just can't do this without you guys. Thank you. Give it a like if you like the video. Dislike if you don't like it. Let me know why, so that I can improve. Comments, please let me know what you think about all these builds. Or all these archetypes, rather. And I recently made a community post that mentions this but go to our website the dis the link will be in the description and it's also on our about page about tab in youtube um it has all of the builds and the fillable pdfs for the builds that i make on this channel and also walkthroughs for them and just other pathfinder related stuff and f rpg fantasy related stuff so go take a look and if you would like to help contribute to the channel like one of our lovely patrons, you could be one of those special people. Just go to our Patreon and see what we have to offer. See if it's something you might be interested in. I'd appreciate the help. This was truly a pleasure to go through. I didn't expect that. I don't like the Curse Maelstrom, but I do see that it has purposes now. I disliked the Hallowed Necromancer strongly, but now I like it. It's not just for fighting undead. I think that I had a sour taste in my mouth because it says necromancer in the title. It is not what I think of as a necromancer. It doesn't do anything with undead that's helpful to them. And that's what I think of as a necromancer. I mean, like, even going back to second edition D&D, necromancy was the spell that you summon skeletal claws that drain life from people. This is not at all. This ain't your daddy's necromancy. It's really cool though. When you look at it as an archetype that is utility against undead and healing, it has a lot of merit. There are a lot of benefits to taking this archetype. 
Part of that is actually getting focus points super fast. Much like the Blessed One. What was the other one? Oh, yeah. The Ursine Avenger Hood. Obviously, I, I think the Bear Wrestler would be great. And it is useful on its own. But if you do combine it to capitalize on the strengths that it gives you, like being able to grab automatically, in some other way, maybe not the wrestler, but the wrestler was just this great image I had in my mind. I had to have a bear that could suplex somebody. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. I know I'm a little nuts. I'm glad you watched these videos. I appreciate you. I'll see you next time.